Welcome to Belmont Poetry Night. I am Monica Corday, your host and the Poet Laureate of Belmont, California. We meet on the third Tuesdays of every month to celebrate the spoken word as makers, listeners, and admirers of poetry. We come with featured guests and an open mic, inviting readers of all ages. After gathering for several years at our favorite physical venue, the Belmont Library, since the pandemic, our thriving poetry circle has transitioned to, to this virtual space. And I'm grateful this allows me to welcome poets and listeners from across the globe. And this is what I love about poetry, is that it creates a bridge connecting all of us. Uh, it is always brilliant to see uh, you folks in the room. So thanks for joining me and Zooming in. And as tradition goes, I'd love to know where you're joining me from. So please share in the chat and let's move forward. This is Belmont Poetry Night's second year celebrating in the spirit of pride through poetry. Pride, the designated name or slogan that commemorates the anniversary of the Stonewall in riots of 1969. And it is important to remember some of the heroes who fought back, which led to an uprising in protest. Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans woman celebrating her 25th birthday at the time of the riots and a tour de force in the gay community. Sylvia Rivera, an activist and self-professed drag queen who also played a part in the Stonewall riots. She fought for transgender rights alongside Marsha P. Johnson. Stormé de Larvery was a gay rights activist and drag performer who was also at Stonewall when it was raided that night. LGBTQIA plus activism has brought about many changes over the years to queer lives, but it is still going on today. And there are so many queer heroes who have taken up the torch and continue to fight back. To celebrate the queer heroes of the past and present, I wanted to curate this poetry night in the theme Queeros. Poetry, as we all know, is not limited to an expression of inner feelings. Uh, and it has always gone beyond and uh, to me, it is really about serving society and culture. Through these poetry nights, for instance, I hope to create more opportunities to feature poetry from many quarters in California's Bay Area. One such piece of poetry that I'd like to open this evening with is written by Meg Day, who grew up in the Bay Area. The poem is titled, If You're Staying, I'll stay too. Maybe it's easier having been named after someone. Nobody expects that you will rule the underworld or judge the dead, but they call you Pluto anyway. Planet too. I know a girl like you who used to be a thing she isn't anymore, but hasn't changed at all whose orbit didn't circle straight, whose size and distance never quite seemed right, but no one cared till now. I was a woman once, rounded by my own gravity, catcalled into hades by men who could not see this gem of a hard rock was not made magnetic for the likes of them. Hey, little mama, don't take it so hard. So we are frigid, so we stay relegated out here with our kin. I'll wear my fade tight and my tie loose if you play your radio loud. They say we are known only in comparison to that which surrounds us. So I'd guess they'll hear our signal soon. I was a woman once. But that's not the farthest thing from the sun. Another universe might have let me be. Another universe might have let us be. Thank you. Meg Day 
is a deaf, genderqueer poet and the author of Last Psalm at Sea Level. They are an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. A wonderful thing they once said in an interview uh, that stayed with me was that the page, it starts out blank, no matter who you are. So wherever you are in life or in poetry today, that's absolutely fine. The important thing is to just be there on purpose. What a powerful message, right? Well, more power to the poets, I say. And in connection to our theme today, more power to all those queer heroes who permeate spaces and conversations through their work in community and their art. I'm so thrilled to welcome Zara Jamshed as my featured poet tonight, who is doing exactly that, and I'd like to introduce them to you all. Zara Jamshed is a queer, trans, disabled Pakistani-American poet from NYC living in the East Bay. They are the winner of the Penrose Poetry Prize for LGBTQIA plus writers and have work published in The Arrow, Keppel Health Review, TV Collective Magazine, and the Protest Through Poetry Anthology. Zara is a Periplus Collective Fellow, was featured at Kearney Street Workshop Literary Arts Showcase, and has had their work supported by WONA, Open Mouth Literary, and Anaphora Arts. Their full-length poetry collection, Neither Created Nor Destroyed, was a semi-finalist for the Pamet River Prize, a finalist for the Stories Award for Poetry, and will be published with Game Over Books in November 2023. Congratulations for that, Sarah. Putting their engineering degree to use, they currently work to bring the economic and environmental benefits of solar energy to California's low-income renters. A warm welcome, Zara. The mic is all yours. Thank you. I awoke with the ancestors in my sports bra. I feel them in the pull of elastic, the straps slicing at my shoulders, and the way my breasts are pulled towards the heart of me. A hug that just keeps going. All their wild, all the flowing drapes of their lives now etched in the indentations along my t-shirt. I take off the shirt first, hold my womanhood like the good China, something inherited and passed down, but only held during special occasions. What is the opposite of support? When the polyester or cotton or whatever plastic made fabric lifts above the shoulder blades and up, I rise with the release. Know their love will keep me close until the quiet of my alone. Or alone with all the genders and versions of myself I could have been. Thank you so much, Monica, for having me. Um, happy Pride Month, everybody. Um, it's been a busy month. There's a lot happening. Um, and uh, I'm yeah, really excited to just uh, show you all my collection of strange trans queer stuff. Um, Monica um, and I had the opportunity to uh, be together in Belmont, California at the beginning of the month um, to raise the pride flag, which was very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, just feeling very grateful to to be in this space and and to be here with all of you. Um, so a lot of my writing uh, focuses on on the intersection of being both queer and trans. I'm a non-binary trans person, and my pronouns are they them. Um, and the intersection of of my faith, uh, being a being a, a Muslim person. Um, and so this is a a poem called uh, Akika. Akika is kind of the closest thing that Muslims have to baptism. It's a ceremony that happens shortly after birth, uh, like welcoming uh, an infant into, into the faith. Um, and so that's what this next poem is about. Instead of baptism by water, 
a Muslim baby is welcomed into the world with a head shaved clean. I emerged from the womb with a head full of hair. In the joy of new parenthood and the speed that hair sprouted from my scalp, there's an entire photo gallery of my repeated blessings. My father grinning under bulbous glasses, me bald and wailing in one hand, buzzers in the other. Even before I was born, my mother prayed I would have good hair. I kept it long and unbrushed, let the dark protein trail behind me like I was afraid of getting lost. In the scatter, I could thread an ocean, a rising of all the selves I leave behind. When the rumble of a new gender quaked, my auntie took me to the hairdresser. One loud snip and there was no more ocean, only rediscovery of scalp. At home, my father swallowed his disapproval, finding his tremor at the back of my neck for the first time in 18 years. I have now let most of the length return, finding new ways to tend to and worship this wild water. I still keep an undercut along my right side, hold my duality and call it prophecy. With the clippers in my hand at the bathroom mirror, I build my own blessing over and over again. That was beautiful, Zara. Thank you. Absolutely amazing. And Akika is one of my favorite uh, pieces there by you. Uh, I'd like to just go back to both the pieces that you uh, just offered and uh, take our audience through some of the lines that have deeply connected with me. <clears throat> and I was just noting them down while you were reading it uh, from your uh, the first poem that you opened with. Uh, I rise with the release, know their love will keep me close until the quiet of my alone or alone with all the genders and versions of myself I could have been. What beautiful crafting there. And uh, from Akika, uh, <clears throat> these are really gorgeous lines. I could thread an ocean, a rising of all the selves I leave behind when the rumble of a new gender quaked. It's absolutely amazing, Zara. I love how uh, you just go into and dive, dive deep into these lines. Uh, and as uh, we are listening to your poetry, uh, most of us are listening to it for the first time. Uh, a question that often gets asked, uh, I have the same question for you to begin with. Poets often discover poetry as an outlet, uh, a release for their emotions. Uh, tell us, how did you discover poetry and when? I, I have been a writer for a very long time and I, the initial goal was to be a fiction writer. Um, I was obsessed with how um, people could be so forward thinking to have this entire gigantic plot um, and I wanted to do it myself and it was really, really hard. Um, and so uh, I would like get to the beginning and the beginning would be great, but then I needed a middle and then I needed an end and it just all fell apart from there. Um, and what I loved about poetry was how much of a snapshot it could be. Um, and then the more I started writing, the more I realized that poetry has this unique ability to time travel in a way that I feel like is less accessible in fiction. Um, I can be, you know, 18 and then suddenly zoom to the age I am now, I'm 28, um, in a couple of lines and it can still feel coherent and not rushed. Um, but I, yeah, definitely didn't start using poetry as like an outlet until much later, um, particularly during the pandemic. It felt incredibly important. It was the only thing that seemed to make any sort of sense. Um, it was both like a way to process my emotions, but also to like document where we were emotionally at that time. I feel like so many of us are very quick to write 2020 off and be like, that happened, okay, bye. Um, but like, there was so much we were feeling. We were feeling abandoned. We were feeling love. We were feeling like a sense of freedom. We were feeling isolated and lonely. And like that, like 
cultural archival work like felt really important and that's like the thing I zeroed in on to like keep myself engaged and like motivated while it was me and my one roommate uh, during the pandemic. Well, thanks for sharing that, Sarah. I think everybody has a very unique journey into uh, what they are passionate about. And it's always so wonderful to hear how how you navigated uh, your way through through all of the things that you saw and experienced. Uh, let's let's hear a few more poems before we go on. Sure. So uh, I had top surgery uh, at the beginning of this year, about four months ago. Um, and uh, it was it was a very emotional journey for me. Um, and uh, this poem is one I wrote as I was making the decision to, to decide to embark on this very long and arduous process of trying to get surgery. Um, and so this poem is called Metamorphosis. And this was like after all of my friends had gotten surgery and I was like sitting and trying to decide what to do. All of my friends got top surgery this year. And I think I understand the need to find a permanent kind of remaking, to stretch the clay, wield shape in the intention of hands building. I'm afraid to be my own creator. Let the masculinity drip off me like water. Let my hair sprout beyond its harvest. Maybe the collapse comes before the expanse. Maybe home is only made known in its absence. What I do know is something is eating me alive from the very guts of my frame, and I am still here. I am not trying to build a gender out of mirrors or belonging out of needles. No, the seed needs to crack before the bloom. Bursting into becoming is indulgently natural. Peacock's feathers and lion's manes command in their growth. For now, I stare at a magnified reflection, tweezers in hand. Shaky fingers pluck mustache hairs at black roots, exhaling cobwebs out of my ribcage. I do not think belonging is a place, but it took a crash to make a universe. Home exploding into being where there was once only void. I am still reaching in the dark, waiting to sink my teeth into the someone I could become. I think conservation is only dreamed in white imaginations. The rest of us know the warmth of entropy, of always being undone. We are the light of tidal shifting, crystal refractions of all the colors we have yet to imagine. I am threadbare and breaking cutting loose all that makes me smaller. I have been small for long enough. Um, and then in the vein of metamorphosis and like external dreaming fantasy, um, uh, this, uh, Next one is, is called, I dreamed I swallowed the moon. I dreamed I swallowed the moon whole, like how some people eat oysters, focused only on the texture, river of brine and vinegar running down the throat. Only the moon was thicker, full bodied, less acidic, had a milky coconut aftertaste. The stars asked me why I had eaten their nightlight. How selfish could I possibly be to think that I alone had the mouth, the will, the worthiness to take in all that moves calendars, tides, maps, or magnetic fields. I tried to explain. It wasn't only arrogance. It was mostly devotion. If I had to pick a way to go, shouldn't I die as I lived? Hungry wanting. In the inky void of our gravitational pull, do I not deserve to touch divinity for it destroys me?
Wow, I'm staying with both your pieces there. And uh, this just reminded me of uh, uh, another poem uh, that I had read by Joshua Espinosa, The Moon is Trans, is how the poem begins. And uh, I think moon is such a strong metaphor when uh, I'm listening to or, or reading some trans poetry. Uh, uh, I would like to um, also go back to one of the lines uh, in your previous poem, uh, a metamorphosis uh, that is so heavy with emotions and led, laden with your uh, very intimate experience. And thank you so much for sharing that, Azara. I think it's so important for all of us to listen to these experiences and stories which are so uh, coming from uh, coming from within you. And it's uh, it would be difficult to understand what the person is going through or where they have come from without knowing these stories. So uh, the line which uh, which reads, I understand the need to find a permanent kind of remaking. Uh, I think that right, a line itself, uh, it, it captures wonderful anguish, I will say. Uh, at the same time, it also captures this uh, amazing freedom that you experience in, in saying that. And uh, it, it is definitely hard, but you live your life out loud and unapologetically as a queer and trans individual. And I applaud you for this because the act of being yourself is an act of bravery. And that to me is nothing less than heroic. Uh, and uh, um, the uh, these lines from uh, um, Ocean Wong's poem, uh, I think the poem was titled Reasons for Staying. And in that he writes, because I stopped apologizing myself towards visibility, because this body is my last address. And I see poets often are writing themselves into existence and much of your poetry becomes a vessel to hold your own self. Uh, since the time you came out, in what ways does your experience of transitioning and gender identity influence your work and how do you navigate your world as a trans poet and activist? Oh man, not an easy question. Um, so I guess for context, I have been out for a very long time. Um, I came out as queer in 2013 and I came out as trans in 2014. Um, so this has been my state of existence for, for quite some time. Um, and I think, that like one of the things that I never want to speak on behalf of a group. I think that it gets really messy very quickly. And so something that I guess like keeps me authentic, even though like that word feels so like icky, it's like very, it's so much in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, I think the, the key to staying authentic is yeah, just to, to focus on, yeah, kind of one's individual emotional experience. Um, and that way it doesn't matter how much like shared identity there necessarily is. Um, you're you're coming from this, this perspective that that's purely like yeah, emotions driven and we all experience emotions. Um, but I think I also like write for a very specific audience. Um, I, I write for like queer and trans people of color, um, like very specifically um, to name the ways in which we're like also like othered within our community um, and like need to kind of, there, there won't be spaces unless we take them. Um, and and part of the, the beauty of poetry is you can create the utopia you want in the poem, you can map it out, do that like freedom architecture within the poem. And uh, so like writing a poem pre top surgery about like all the things I, I hoped would happen, having that now and reflecting on it, um, having actually experienced it, uh, it just like, yeah, it's like a, a personal history kind of like catalog. Um, 
but in terms of how it influences my my work not every poem is just like this is about queer stuff and trans stuff um i write about all sorts of things i fall in love i get angry at people i have a hard time at work like all of these things are just part of my experience i never am like not trans in any of the things that i do um going to the airport you're trans like just all the different like ways in in which like a, a body is a single like suitcase you can't like unpack the suitcase um into its individual components and be like i'm experiencing this as a muslim person i'm experiencing this as a trans person um like no you're experiencing everything simultaneously um and so like part of what's exciting about poetry is being able to express like freedom in all of those different ways equally as well so imagine your whole entire self is like free and liberated and like devoid of of oppressive systems um but yeah i think particularly in this time i think the ways in which people understand trans people is through media and media is very unkind to trans people right now um even liberal media like the new york times does an absolute garbage job of covering issues particularly around surgery and 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 gender affirming hormones like they completely get it wrong they're very interested in these like very like regressive like anti-trans narratives about how hormones are gonna you know they're irreversible you can't do any like it's these huge permanent changes and like people get tattoos the huge permanent change people get you know boob jobs those are gender affirming changes like there are so many ways in which gender affirming care is like not limited to trans people um and so like one of the biggest questions people ask me during surgery was like are you sure and like you want to be able to have an actual conversation with the emotional difficulties of no i'm not sure but like this is the surest i'm i'm going to be and like poetry becomes a like vessel to like do that Well, thank you for sharing, Zara. I think you have brought uh, our attention to such important things. Uh, and uh, we are, as a community, I think we are always uh, so focused on labels, uh, whereas we are, uh, we should be all focusing on identities and accepting those identities that we all, uh, I'll all hold within us. So thanks for bringing our attention to all of that and, and making this conversation so important and wholesome and powerful at the same time. Uh, let's hear uh, your next uh, poems that you have to offer. Sure. Um, so we're going to take a little pivot away from gender. Um, I don't know if I've actually performed this poem before. Um, it, uh, it's just called the airport poem. Um, yeah. It is surprising I have not written you by now. Know your mythology like the green sash on my suitcase at baggage check. In the way I cradle my breath, keep it close like duty freely, like duty freely curve. Hmm, excuse me. I learned the wax and wane of scantrons in the dance we did for my cousin's wedding. At the checkpoint, they ask me if I am a boy or a girl or an abandoned travel pillow. I hold my bound chest and say girl like I mean it, like I am it, like I can will my entire being into a shot glass from the souvenir shop between the Harlequin paperbacks and the sun chips. They ask my mother when the last time she visited Palestine was and the everything in me lights up the scanners, the scanner sensors in a gasoline rainbow. They say you are free to go but only after every underwear has been unfolded. They ask me if I know my father and I lie. They ask me what I'm bringing into the country and I don't say dynamite. The Sikh family is ahead of me in the security line, and I ease closer in silent kinship. I take the prayer necklace off. I need a different kind of God here. They keep the over ear headphones on as long as possible. Wrap my head in the veil of music, shoes off. I have a ticket to take me home, and I am already shivering in the recirculated air. No, there is no shelter beyond the departure gate. Um, 
while we're talking about fraught spaces. Um, last year, I had the incredible privilege to make the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, I made Umrah with my mother, my two aunties, and my grandma. Um, and it was a clusterfuck of an experience. Um, I, uh, spiritually, emotionally, just incredibly powerful. I learned a lot of history. I've prayed more than I've ever prayed in my life. Um, but is in Saudi Arabia is a very gendered space. Um, and there's a lot of sisters here, brothers here, stuff. Um, but when I actually was in front of the Kaaba and like making the pilgrimage, I like was just so moved and overwhelmed. Um, and uh, so this poem is called, I thanked Allah for making me queer and trans. I thanked Allah for making me queer and trans at Mecca's holy marble. Bare feet tracing seven winding circles. The Kaaba loomed, a gold speckled worry stone emitting a towering magnetic aliveness. Tears streamed into my mask as I was suddenly alone in a sea of three million people, prayers ringing out in every direction. I asked Allah if I was a mistake and Allah said no. I cried and stood in the company of every queer Muslim who had come before me, who stood where I stood, threadbare, seams bursting, questioning their own holiness. A job and abaya on in the largest prayer room without gender, I know my transness stretched farther than the piazza into every mountain, gravel heap, clock tower across this city made of stone and history. I remind myself that I belong to a history. When the tawaf is complete, I hold my mother's hand, lay the prayer rug on the cool, cool white tile and press my forehead to the earth, surrendering to every ounce of belief I hold. I sit on my knees, palms open, having never felt so small. I need to take a breath uh, before I ask my question to you. After listening to that piece, uh, Zara, it is truly uh, deeply moving. And uh, the way you have uh, written yourself into this piece is just astounding to me. Uh, such talent there that I see. And uh, thank you so much for also sharing uh, the most vulnerable uh, experiences uh, that you have had. Um, this line uh, which says, and I'll go back to your poem. I know my transness stretched farther than the piazza into every mountain. I would like our audience to stay with this line. And just the title itself, I thanked Allah for making me queer and trans. I just find it so powerful in itself and so full of gratitude, uh, Zara. Even the airport poem, uh, going back to that piece, uh, like you said, it's just an airport poem. <laughs> Well, it's it's so much more than that, and I love how your poems are la are layered, and uh, in that I I see your heritage coming into uh, coming into the subject, um, and uh, talking about heritage, um, I think lineage is uh, in poetry is really a powerful idea to explore, and not that folks aren't talking about it, but poetry as a way to seek out elders or to honor them in any way uh, that can truly lead to a newer understanding of ourselves and our own identities. Uh, and your poems are a clear paying of homage to the elders and ancestors, even in the first piece that you opened with was about ancestors. Uh, can you talk more about the themes of lineage and legacy in your poetry? And also do share uh, the, the story about you and your grandmother taking the poetry class. Yes. Um, yes, the ancestors are present in, in a lot of my work. In the book I've written, um, each kind of like, I guess, chapter um, is marked off by a, a play scene between Zara and the ancestors. And the ancestors kind of act as like a, they 
prevent like stagnation. If it's clear mm -hmm. that Zara is like waffling between making a decision or not, the ancestors are like, nope, you gotta go. Um, <laughs> it's like a little brusque, a little like, it's not like kind, but it is like with love and like with affection. Um, and I feel like, um, yeah, on honoring like particularly my like Muslimness and like reflecting on like how this religion has existed for 1400 years and like that's like what a what a legacy to be a part of um and for me like my connection to Islam really like was like only strengthened when I came out um mm -hmm. when I first got to the bay I was really fortunate to um be a part of a like queer Muslim support group, which turned into like a community organizing like space. Um, and so a lot of like religious stuff that I didn't necessarily know growing up, I like learned with other queer and trans people. Um, we had, we didn't have like men praying in the front, women praying in the back, like all of these kind of, um, I think people think Islam is a, like a religion of rules. And that mm -hmm. like, you have to follow the rules in order to be a good Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if there's 1.4 billion of us, like we celebrate and like honor um, our relationship to the universe and all that's land of like beyond our understanding um, in really different ways. Um, and uh, so these are two things that me and my grandma have connected on. Like a lot of what I know about Islam is from her. And then we've also connected for a love of poetry. My grandma, she took Islamic studies when she returned to school after her husband passed away. Um, and so she's read a lot of like Persian poetry, Urdu poetry, Hindi poetry. Um, and, uh, but she was uh, less familiar with English poetry. And so my auntie got us a, a poetry class together and she wrote her first poem and it was so good. Um, the, the teacher was like really impressed and, um, yeah, it was just like a really sweet story about her, like, like being kind of a like matchmaker between like two of her friends who, who eventually like became married. Um, and yeah, I want like it's thinking about ancestry you're not just thinking about like oh how do I honor those who came before us but I, I feel like I'm also thinking about the descendants a lot what is the mark that I want to leave on the earth so that like those who come after have have something like more free and um more liberatory with more possibilities than than before um and yeah I feel like it's truly one of those vessels for like describing emotional lessons um, and lessons such as like, you don't need to, like your version of, you know, of practice doesn't have to look like everyone else's version of practice. And especially in Islam, there's no like, there's no Pope, there's no like bishops, like everyone's relationship with Islam is is unique and individual. And like, I've found a lot of like liberation and joy in like reconnecting with my religion. Um, and like, I've been able to kind of also help my like aunties who were very disconnected because they felt really alienated by this sort of like rigidity of mainstream practice. Like I led prayer for them, like when we were in Mecca, like, often um and so like this intergenerational kind of like not only can I like receive wisdom I can also impart wisdom and like there there's like a there's a dialogue there that I think is is really special absolutely I couldn't agree more uh Zara and uh yeah let's go ahead with one more poem and then I'll I do have a question for you and then you can uh, have offer us another one as well Perfect. Thank um, you. Uh, something I focus on in my work a lot is uh, what I call third culture. Um, 
as someone who is a kiddo of immigrants, um, but born and raised in the US, um, we both belong to and are not really a part of both our ancestral culture and the culture that we live in. Um, and so this poem is really a love letter to third culture children who feel like they're a disappointment all the time um, to show that they're not a disappointment um, and that we have like unique skills and abilities that, uh, you know, are, are valuable. Um, and so this poem is called The Beaches We Build. We, children of the third culture, reach across continents, boil the lost river water into tea, purify in the steam of all that descends from ocean. We build siblings out of dances, hold the surety of the wolf pack in the pounding of our feet, the sways of our hips, the singing loud in the cathedrals of our rib cages. We photosynthesize in the high sun, our brown skin glittering from the water at our feet. Down at the shore, we take turns birthing ourselves. No one asks where we're really from. We are really from outer space, from the bluest void, from the smell of smoke when the fire is going out. We are your uncle's deepest shame. Your grandma turns in her grave knowing there wasn't space for us while she was here. We butcher the language like an animal, prey over the bones, tear through the heart of the lifeline. We pronounce our own names wrong, giggling during the prayer. We chew with our mouths open, carve protection spells into each other's spines. Our skirts are too short. We stay out too late. We make music out of all our alphabets, tongues sharp, know how to turn scraps into what feels like wholeness. If it storms, we are sheltered. We call each other home. Thank you, Zara. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, the third generation uh, who are definitely have, have so much to offer to us. And uh, on that note, my question to you is uh, that many teenagers, especially those who are poets and writers who are in one way or another marginalized, uh, are quite often frustrated with the complicated process of reclaiming themselves through writing and art. And you must have had several poetry mentors shaping your work as a queer artist. Uh, what advice would you give to poets inspired by your work? Uh, and is there any advice uh, you would like to share with young queer and Muslim American artists in particular? Um, I have had several mentors um, that I'm extremely grateful for. Um, I think part of the key in finding mentorship is not necessarily looking for status. Um, I feel like I have been mentored by so many of my peers who don't necessarily like submit stuff to journals or like try to get stuff published or like seeking out every open mic. Um, I think a lot of what comes in, in terms of like finding your like literary path is first off, like the business is separate, like take the business element out of it and you'll just be so much happier. I like, I think initially thought I wanted to be a professional poet um, and I don't believe that anymore. I think part of what like, it's definitely like more than a hobby, um, but I think that if you get too sucked into the capitalism of it, it just becomes less fun. Um, and like the the point is to is to find joy, to find release, to um, to connect. Um, and so, I think part of like establishing yourself, and by establishing yourself, I mean like finding your voice as as a poet is a lot of it is really just listening. Um, being in the room where other people are performing, taking taking stuff in, telling someone afterwards you really liked what they said, and like looking up their work later, but figuring out what exactly moves you, and then trying to like emulate that style through your own writing. Um, one of the best things about the pandemic was that everyone offered virtual workshops. And so that's all I did. I just sat in a whole bunch of workshops and um just like absorbed like a sponge. 
um, everything I possibly could. Um, and I think in terms of like, specifically for marginalized artists like your work doesn't have to be for everyone so like most of the like residencies and stuff that you were talking about are specifically for people of color I don't need to be in you know just sort of any generic place where I'm the only brown person the only trans person the only Muslim person like then you sort of end up tokenizing yourself you like feel this weird need to like represent and um it's just miserable like people will tell you they like your work to your face and then not vote for it when the slam comes and like that's incredibly disappointing and frustrating um and a lot of it is just because it's they don't value your work and so you have to value your work um when i was submitting for publication like i looked at people's rosters and was like okay am i gonna be the only trans person no I'm not even the only queer Muslim person at Game Over Books. Um, like they are really intentional about like curating spaces. And like if the space you want doesn't exist, you can also make it. Um, it doesn't have to be big or fancy. Um, all it needs to do is, yeah, like satiate that hunger. Um, and so like be discerning. Like you don't have to just like throw your work into the wind and like see what lands like um you can you can cast a smaller net and like find your audience the audience you're actually writing for um and then like be rewarded by like being in an actual like community with with other writers uh can you hear me still? Yes. Okay, I I couldn't hear the last bit you said, Azara, but I, I heard most of uh, the things that you mentioned, and uh, that was hella good advice. I'll say <laughs> <laughs> more you. power, more power to you, and such uh, such a, a rock star advice. I'll say because it's so important for uh, each of us to remember and not get lost in in the the thought of representation and the pressure of it uh where you are a certain person and everybody wants you to be that person even in your poetry and you just want your poetry to be free from all of that but at the same time just allow yourself to express in every way that is possible so i think it's so important to uh, all of our young uh, younger listeners to hear as they are emerging and developing their art, especially. Uh, I do have one more question for you, uh, Zara, but I'd like to uh, have the question later. Uh, why don't you go ahead and offer us uh, another piece? Okay. Thank um, you. Sure. Uh, let's see. Um, I, speaking of finding your community, I got to do this amazing thing last year um it was hosted by the san francisco public library it was called the kaleidoscope workshop um they're finishing now but any young poets in the bay area you should look for it because it's great um uh it's for folks under 26 who are like queer and trans and of color um and we talked a lot about ancestry um and like connection to queer ancestry in particular it's run by the Queer Ancestors Project and still here in San Francisco. They're both amazing organizations. Um, and Perfect. And uh, yeah, if you have any links or any important resources to share later in the I will, chat, Azara, I will find that'd them. be great. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, and so this is a piece that was written there. Um, our first task was to run through the library and like it was like a scavenger hunt. And the book I found that I was really drawn to was a collection of essays um, or interviews uh, from Harvey Milk. Um, and he was reflecting on like his time in New York and sort of what it, how it connected to his time in San Francisco. Um, and as someone who's from New York and then moved to the Bay, I was, found a lot of resonance with that. Um, so this poem is called, Everything is Truer at a Remove. And it is after uh, Randall Mann, who is also a, San Francisco based poet, queer poet. I think about forgetting New York, 
all black trash bags standing guard in rows, sky closer in the company of metal that hasn't learned gravity. All the cigarettes I wish I was smoking down every avenue litter the sidewalk. The world is here and I can walk along the dirty river to it, subway to it. I think of forgetting January's slush when it freezes over and crunches under knockoff timberlands. I think of forgetting May's cherry blossoms, baby pink, baby pink and romantic, so fleeting if you get off at the wrong stop, you'll miss them. There's nothing fuller and less renewable than a New York minute, all kinetic and desperate energy with no room to breathe. But I am a continent away now. Waterside view, a pond called a lake. The herons and pelicans take communion with Canadian geese and seagulls over blue-gray water. The Berkeley hillscape in the distance, a rolling topography of straw brown and evergreen. I think of forgetting east, forgetting winter, only learning fruit from the tree, only suns that melt orange into a fierce cliffside ocean. I think of forgetting everywhere and going somewhere new, letting this version of me decay gray into the soil. I think of draping myself in wildflowers and becoming the dirt, dark, rich, alive, everything that dirty water stretches to reach. Woohoo! That was absolutely amazing, Zara. Thank you so much for uh, offering that uh, that piece. I think it's it it really brings about the contrast of the two worlds that you have lived in, but at the same time enriches uh, us with with all that you're experiencing, taking in from the, your past world and and your present world. And I love the line which uh, with, where you speak about turning into dirt, so rich and alive. Uh, love that thought. And uh, uh, an important thought that I wanted to bring into our conversation is, uh, you have talked about this uh, before and um, during the conversation today, uh, that although trans representation is greater today, the community is threatened by uh, the recent anti-trans legislation. And I remember you spoke to me how the silence from cisgender people is quite loud and how there is still a trepidation about what to say around trans people. So how do you forge ahead through this dissonance where on one hand, trans identity is being celebrated on stages across the country, and yet you are still having to deal with these issues that come from being openly queer or trans. And uh, tell me, how can people support you today? Okay. Um, so, yes, we, we are in a very bizarre time, culturally, and like legally, as it like comes to transness. Um, I think that what's happening is that those in power um, are realizing the potential transness has to upset a lot of our kind of like social economic structures. Um, if you do not opt in to a gender binary, then all of these things that we tell you each gender needs, um, men need this, women need this. Um, suddenly you've just, you've lost so much investment in any of these structures. Um, and so folks in, in power are grappling. They're, they're trying to seize whatever they can um, in order to, to maintain that power. Um, I will say the conservatives are very obvious. They like are disgusted by us. They like are really fascinated by our genitals um, and like are, are very like concerned with how we have sex and things like that. Um, Liberal people, on the other hand, it's very different. Um, I think there is very much this perception that like all queer issues resolved themselves in 2015 once gay marriage was legalized. Um, and the whole like love is love campaign, like I think is a huge disservice to our community um, because it's so much more about like reinvesting us in these oppressive systems than it is about actually getting us free. Um, and so, I think one of the like 
biggest things is like, you can just give trans people money. Like <laughs> that's a really big one. Um, like we're at like huge risks of like being like houseless, unemployed, unable to get medical care. Like so much of it is just about like redistribution of resources. Um, you can pay trans people. They're on the internet. Go to any GoFundMe for trans people and like fund someone's top surgery. Like that's a perfect way to celebrate pride. Um, uh, but I think also kind of more than that is like people, most people's exposure to trans people is through media and media casts like cisgender actors to play trans people all the time. And that like teaches us that like, it like leads to the perception that like trans people are like cis people who like put on costumes and then take them off and then can like move about their lives. It's like, no, we, these are just, this is how we walk around every day. Um, a documentary I would recommend uh, is called Disclosure. It's on Netflix. Um, I think Laverne Cox is one of the people who helped make it happen. Um, but it's all like trans people in media who give a really like comprehensive history of like representations of transness in media and why those representations inform how trans people are treated in real life. Um, and like, I think that people are so nervous about asking questions that they just uh, choose to like completely like abscond from any conversations. And that silence is really thoroughly unhelpful because like, no one has decided that like queer and trans people are a voting block with political power. No one's invested in like trying to get our vote or anything like that. Um, but we do have political power and like, we're gonna keep taking care of ourselves. We are, are very good at that. Um, but uh, I think a lot of it is like, if you don't know something, Google it and um, give trans people money and like, reflect on kind of like, what's your relationship to gender? I think people think gender is something that like kind of only happens to trans people. And like, what do you find resonance with, with the gender that you are? What do you find dissonance with? What like feels really like oppressive and confining and constricting? Um, while we were in Saudi Arabia, I was talking to my aunt who is generally, she is not very conservative in, in how she dresses and was sort of forced to like assimilate into like wearing an abaya and wearing hijab because that's just what you do there. Um, and I asked her, I was like, are you experiencing gender dysphoria? Like your internal sense of self is one thing, but you can't express it to the world. Like that's what trans people deal with all the time. Well, uh, thanks, Sarah, for sharing those thoughts with such truth and honesty and uh, uh, for, for bringing to light uh, how, how trans people and uh, queer people can, in general, be supported uh, monetary and non-monetary uh, ways. And uh, thank you again for that impressive set. Uh, I'll say this, that uh, inside... Uh, the evocative power of a poem. We can all live and breathe with all manner of existence. And your poems today evoked that kind of power and that existence for me. And uh, I love how your work braids together an understanding of ancestry, uh, history with your own understanding of identity, place, and belonging. And I love the tenderness and authenticity with which you write. So thanks so much for being here and sharing today. I'm sure everyone agrees with me. And uh, I'll open up the floor briefly for any appreciative comments from the audience before we close this segment. I encourage uh, you to unmute and share, uh, talk to Zara. And as you do that, please uh, also look for some links to Zara's work that I'll be posting in the chat. Thank you, Zara. That was, that was truly remarkable. You can't see my face, you can see my picture. I have never been able to solve my video, I'm Phil. Um, it's great to listen to. Uh, I couldn't be more the opposite from where you are being an old white guy, but um, I do get it, you know? It's one of those things that, you know, it's, I don't know what to do about it, but I understand the need for it and who, you know, that it's not, not even a need, it's like you are who you are. 
And that came across, you know, really strongly and I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, it was beautiful. I know um, about Sarah, uh, about Arabic, um, where you came from, the Muslim, because I myself, I was raised in that, um, that part of the area. So I'm originally from South Sudan and I was raised in North, uh, which is the Muslim world. So when I, you know, I was young, I had to run out of school when I was nine years old because I was forced to wear hijab and I was, didn't want to. And the attempt actually, you know, to take my life. So I have to escape to Egypt. And that's the reason I came to America. So I, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough world. But I am so grateful that you're open and you somewhere safe that, because, you know, somewhere is, we're not safe. But um, just keep pushing and keep open-minded. And there's no one have power over you but yourself. You know, if you keep, you know, trusting God, you'll be okay. And I just thank you for a beautiful poem tonight. It just touched my heart. Thank you for sharing. All right, thank you so much. Um, I Monica knows I tend to be a little, I uh, could be a little long-winded if I'm going off script, but um, thank you for Monica for bringing queer poetry to Belmont Poetry Night and Zara, I really appreciated everything you had to say. And I think it's, it's uh, it's it's super important now and and in the future. Keep up, keep on keeping on. Sarah, this is Lois, and I put in the chat. That I can't come up with any other words other than uh, what I put in the chat. That uh, there are just no words to describe the the depth of your poetry. It's it's. The one word I could think of was exceptional, but that's just not grand enough. But that's the word that I came up with, and you truly have found your voice. So keep keep putting your voice out there. Thanks so much, everyone. Hi, Zara. It's your mom. I I just want to say hi. I just wanted to say that that once again, your poetry made me cry and made me smile and. I'm so proud of you, and I'm, yeah, I really, uh, I'm crying now, so here we go. Anyways, uh, well done, and uh, love you. I love you, too. Okay, Zara, one of the aunties from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I just want to say I do, I love hearing you uh, read your poetry, and and referencing different you know times and experiences that I was there too and every time I both learn more in general but and learn more about you and your perspective so uh, thank you for sharing and uh, um, congrats on the upcoming book and amazing performance. Thanks Hala. Hey Zara, it's Sada, one of your co-workers. And I just wanted to say, I remember hearing some of your poems when we all went virtual and hearing today. And honestly, like I was tearing up and mesmerized and I'm just like kind of bearing witness from very far as you've changed and moved in through different spaces. And I know I'm always learning from you and I just was really honored to be able to listen to you tonight. So thank you. I'm sending you a lot of love. Thanks, Sara. Well then, uh, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts and uh, your love and your comments in the chat as well. And it's always special to have family in the house. So I'm so happy, Zara, your family uh, and your friends uh, are here to support you as well. Uh, and you can also let Zara know how much you appreciated their work by using PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. I've already shared the info in the chat. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and save it uh, if you'd like, or you can access it directly. Um, and Zara, I hope you've had a great time reading and sharing in this space tonight. Uh, yeah, it was such yeah. a pleasure to have you. Thanks for chatting with me. Well, it was a joy. Thanks again. And I'll invite you to the end of our open mic segment for a closing poem. But for now, you can just sit back, relax and enjoy. 
uh, with that, uh, we are going to stop recording this segment. Um, I will, in a minute, uh, stop recording. Uh, and those of you who are in the Zoom room, please stay online for the open, open mic segment of the evening. To the YouTube audience, thanks for joining me and hope to see you for next month's virtual Belmont Poetry Night. Good night. <laughs>